Um, so I thought I would start um, by um, showing um, sort of an excerpt out of a documentary, which is on my first major public artwork at Pr Princeton University. I'll share just a few minutes because I'm conscious we have very little time, and I, um, but I do want to show it because it'll give you sort of an insight into the studio practice. <sighs> Imagination is something that allows me as an artist to call information from the past, find a link to it that links past to present, present to future. And it's also about taking ownership of narrative. And within that premise, I see uh, the act of imagination as a fundamentally political stance. Of that what idea. does an image Far mean when it's mm -hmm. unhinged I from its own the representation? The drawings on paper, especially in historical yes. miniatures, yes. don't end at the edge, but, that, that's the thing. but that's the thing. hint that's the thing. at a narrative the, that continues um, beyond. So even if one looked at the folios of the Princeton University Library's late 16th century manuscript that also inspired this work, you will notice that there's an aspect of infinity in those drawings. That idea has always been at the core of my dismantling traditional miniature paintings. I started to think of the iconography that is within my work and how certain elements um, have a very strong relationship to history and how some of the trenchant historical symbols I have been invested in um, resurrecting them and altering their meaning and shifting their context to see what type of potential there lies within them that they can be, uh, that they can open up new avenues of uh, meaning and interpretation. Animation was a natural outcome of my interest in storytelling. Like recent animations have expanded to multi-channel immersive works. Um, animation like The Last Post and Parallax explore colonial uh, legacy of trade, as well as like the circulation of objects and ideas. Parallax was showing in multiple places uh, in 2016, and, and I was thinking also in terms of a scroll-like space for uh, Princeton. So it may, suddenly there was this epiphany that what if I took the cinematic space and turned it upside down? But maybe the, these dark lines? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be involved yeah. and not just send an image for a paint-by-number reproduction. This can be a little bit less. The sensitivity with which the material of glass is transformed is intrinsic to the final experience of the work. A particular image of the feminine form with no head and it's self-rooted has so much resonance. That image still signifies the expunging of the feminine from histories, from religions, from cultures, from our political discourse. The notion of globe as the body and Africa as its heart had deep resonance for me. And I wanted to bring that idea into the mosaic mural. Art can engage the heart and heart functions as a filter for pursuit of truth. The complexity of beauty is that it can be awe-inspiring, sensorial, sublime. The tension between craft and meaning is almost essential to imagination. Portraiture, too, is like a motif. It's not about a person or a personality. The figure and its skeletal counterpart are about life and death, imagination, and lack of imagination. Quinn 
quintuplet effect plays with this tuplet notation in music. I was thinking of density and layering, packing and unpacking. There are five ideas or notes compressed in this work. Uh, there is reference to American capitalism through my painting, The Big Ritz. Then there's the spiritual dimension, portrait of stasis, portrait of Adam Smith, and an outline of one of the historic Mirage paintings. There's history and then there's storytelling happening in both the works, especially on ideas around redaction, um, then there's the perception of authority, uh, there's power hierarchies, independence. What is freedom? What is freedom especially within the economic global patterns that uh, link all humans. Creativity has no national, racial or religious boundaries. It is the power of imagination that um, fosters new discourse and creates new frontiers. With imagination comes humility and inventiveness. In my practice of drawing, the engagement with the craft, with drawing itself, plays a central role. Drawing implies movement, also in time and across formats and mediums. It's a means of imagining and bringing ideas to life. Movement can be both literal, as in the physical crossing of geographical borders, whether it's bodies or species or commodities or resources. Movement can also be symbolic, and that in the sense of belonging as where do you belong? What are you being excluded from? So then the forms take on a geographically determined space. Why do certain visual motifs represent certain histories? when representations are not static. Movement of objects and ideas historically because of trade and colonial occupation allowed meaning to shift as they entered different contexts. For example, the East India Company affected trade across the globe in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and we are still caught in the same old patterns of inequities of wealth. Adam Smith, argued against monopolies using the demise of the East India Company as a case study. Nick Robin, the author of The Corporation That Changed the World, explains that the East India Company's story as a tragedy, enormous wealth generated at cost of great harm. So in this glass painting, Adam Smith is strapped in the East India Company attire. He's fluttering in the atrium of the economics building at Princeton, his lofty ideas have grown wings, but he is unable to fly. Much of my work examines contested histories of colonialism, mechanisms of power, cultural authority, maritime trade, movement of resources, commodities, oil, naval warfare, warfare imperial air, land travel routes. All such issues are constantly in dialogue. The last post can be seen as a metaphor for societies in flux. It is also an outcome of my ongoing interest in the colonial history of the subcontinent. The title, The Last Post, refers to the bugle call. Commemorating soldiers who die in war, it also signals a call for the end of the day. Here, it refers to the collapse of the Anglo-Saxon hege hegemony over China. The protagonist is an East India Company man who appears in various guises throughout the piece, often as a lurking threat, 
in the imperial rooms of the Mughal Empire, which once ruled much of South Asia. Here you can see it here. Parallax, which was created soon after um, the last post, is now, uh, it was a multi-channel animation which was made also entirely out of hand-drawn elements to demonstrate the technical and emotional malleability of drawing. It was created in 2013 for Sharjah Biennial 11, though it has been traveling since then. Parallax was inspired by the maritime history in the region and tensions over the control of the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. Drawing also operates as a textual and spatial map. So, for example, to illustrate oil, I equated it with ink and recorded the movement of ink to capture the oozing of liquid through the perceived orifices and the cracks of one section of the work. But arrival to the iconography in the work, I was doing research and came across um, the British Petroleum magazines and did not know that the um, oil rigs were, termed, were called Christmas trees. So then I ended up creating Christmas trees born off of those photographic um, encounters. And um, though sort of, so for me, the parallax investigates interdisciplinary, visual, verbal, poetic languages, also migration patterns, cultural quarantine, and the flux of human identity. Motifs and trenchant historical symbol, symbols are given shifting identities as they come together to cultivate new associations through repetition, velocity, and magnitude. So language does become a relevant point of entry in making this work. The language of image making, the language of poetry, of words, of color, of music. The variety of autonomous languages coming together in an experiential manner allow the work to be deeply experienced. So when I was thinking languages, I was also thinking, you know, the origins, genetics, histories, migratory movements, which are incredibly varied in the larger region here. And of course, Urdu, the national language of Pakistan itself is such a confluence with its base in Indo-Aryan Hindustani and its influences from both Arab and Persian languages. Urdu too has gone through a challenging interface with English. For example, the emphasis on English as the medium of instruction when I was growing up in Pakistan directly contributed to my loss of a deep grasp of Urdu. So, and at the same time, the ritualistic engagement with Arabic, for me at least, to facilitate the recitation of the Quran without learning the language created yet another parallax of sort. So for this work, the score was done in classical and colloquial Arabic, and I worked with a composer, I worked with Sharjah Foundation, with local poets, with Diyan, who also was uh, visiting and spent a lot of time researching and creating the score. As a Pakistani, it is impossible for me not to be aware of the migratory labor patterns from Pakistan to the UAE. In Pakistan, class stratification, poverty, lack of educational reform, absence of basic rights for many, the deeply rooted feudal system at play, the impact of refugees from Afghanistan, and the lack of social mobility have created an environment where many men seek work such as here in the neighboring Emirates to support their families. So in one of my visits uh, doing research, um, I, I was driving and we came across this Korfa Khan cinema. And um, when I returned specifically to photograph the cinema, I ran into the caretaker. There was a moment of unexpected delight between us, the guest and host on discovering a mutual Pakistani history. 
meeting the caretaker gave me a different point of entry into the story, which had begun with an architecturally interesting site, followed by the discovery that the building had been commissioned in 1976 by locals from noted Pakistani architects and engineers and was built by Pakistani workers. He himself had come from, pa come from Pakistan in 1976 as a laborer to build the cinema and rose gradually through the ranks from construction worker to manager. What I encountered was a deep sense of pride, commitment, and knowledge about his environment, his space, the architecture to which his visa was directly linked. His contract was to the building itself. It was so profound to see the lived space, his home, in layers of dust and decay. As the building fell apart, he spoke of it as if it were still alive and functional. The theater was his life, his love. His existence was intricately intertwined with it. It was impossible not to think of the temporality and fragility of life within the metaphor of the decaying building and its impact on one individual. Which made me you know, think of um, Mahmoud um, Darvesh's poetry in particular. One um, work, I Have a Seat in the Abandoned Theater. The, that evocative imagery of despair and interconnected fate, which was deeply resonant. So what I uh, what happened was I did this work regardless. You know, it was three two three hours away from the Sharjah um, Art Biennial. It was in Khan, but my audience was uh, was the individual, and um, I projected in the space, and it allowed me to imagine parallax. So the animation score was created with, um, in collaboration with Dian. Dian and I have been working since 2009. And um, she has uh, complete autonomy in the work. And, um, and that has also been a very interesting way of developing um, and pushing these boundaries of what defines a ownership of art. So Parallax has uh, traveled to many countries, and you know, um, it has uh, been sort of in kind of movement for for quite some time. And I am actually going to move move ahead. It was this was at the Tufts Museum. It's shown at the um, Maxi. It's shown in um, Guggenheim, um, Bilbao. Honolulu, it's shown at the Maritime Museum in Hong Kong. So it's really quite wonderful how um, this, um, the support from the Sharjah Foundation as a catalyst to create new work, especially at a time when I was um, not represented by a gallery and I was working, you know, very independently. So, you know, I've, I, I have often expressed to, to, um, to my students too that, there's never one particular path of being an artist. You always, it goes up and down and you have to, um, you know, continuously keep sort of um, creating um, collaborations and bridges across, across languages with other individuals as well as like um, take, um, take that um, uncertainty as fuel so that has been how, how my methodology has constantly um, moved, moved in different directions. So even doing animation or say doing sort of parallax made me think of mosaics. And I wanted to just show that because the idea of the pixel was literally the unit in the mosaic. So it was almost like from that whole journey coming back again to another traditional um, supposedly, whatever, like a traditional, you know, medium. Um, so when Parallax, an excerpt of Parallax actually showed at the um, Times Square, um, it was showing at midnight um, for a month 
for a couple of minutes. And um, that, that, that the audience was completely different. And um, I also um, had moved into animation from from to break out of the preciousness of the small drawings. So here again, I think it was a great opportunity to see how um, the drawing can cross so many different uh, physical boundaries also and um, and and be able to, you know, get re response and as an artist to have access to 40 billboards and be able to uh, use state of the art equipment. And so there was there 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 are multiple sort of layers in in the in the catalyst that and kind of foundation foundational support that you know artists need and require where new works get created in in my career often um, new work has often been born when I've done these sort of residencies in different sites or have taken the time out and have not been burdened by a commercial career. So um, I also wanted to share another project, um, Disruption as Rapture. And uh, this, is, uh, this was done for the Philadelphia Art Museum. It's permanently installed there. They were uh, um, reorganizing their historical South Asian galleries after 40 years and had a gulshan -e ishq in storage and wanted to bring it out and also wanted, had reached out if there was a way to bring that manuscript um, to, to, to find, a, find a fresh way of uh, bringing it to the audience. And I was given a page of a synopsis of this is the story. And, um, you know, it has 5,000 verses in Dakani Urdu. Like, how can that all be summarized in a page? So that was very interesting. Like, who gets to tell the story and who determines what is the story? And that's where I started to, um, that's why I, I was very interested because I've been interested in this. Um, um, idea of the objects that exist in storages in invisibility and um, the provenance of those objects. So the Kulsune Ish itself is an epic poem written in 1657 by Nusrati, court poet to Sultan Ali Adil Shah II of Bijapur. The poem is written in Dakkani Dakan Urdu, which is hard very few people can translate that. And it's basically um, the language of the Muslim elite in South Central India, a North Indian Hindu love story recast as a Sufi tale for an Islamic court. So in this 10 minute film, um, Disruption as Rapture reinterprets Nusrati's poem in Masnavi format. The reference to Sufi enlightenment and Hindu devotional bhakti is explored through forms created from female hair, as uh, well as wings choreographed as particle systems that function as a connecting tissue while carrying the theme of strife and the struggle for truth. So uh, the, again, here I again collaborated with Diyan, but also um, featured a Pakistani uh, musician and writer, novelist, Ali Sethi. And um, if there's time, I would love to share, show uh, a clip of this work too. So the um, collaborative spirit of the work was reflected in the multiplicity of oral and visual languages and in the work's elasticity to be experienced in multiple sites and situations, not just within the South Asian galleries of the Philadelphia Museum of Art that had originally commissioned the work. So that's the way I was looking at it again, that drawing is that it's so rooted in human lineage that can communicate across culture and has the capacity to be introspective as well as forward looking. Um, so the work also ended up uh, being shown at the Lahore, uh, Lahore Biennial, which was just fantastic because then the work was also being shown at the Lahore Fort. And, um, you know, for, uh, for that um, 
uh, venue, Dayan and Ali determined that they wanted to perform the score live and also with um, the Christian choir, girls choir, as well as the young, uh, the boys, the young boys, um, which are in training and they are um, the children of the musicians of the walled city. And so they uh, worked with the kids and the piece was able to bring, allow um, this kind of a new um, improvised a relationship to the work. And also I think the kids really in, uh, took, they took immediately to the medium. And um, uh, for me, it was really amazing to witness that uh, how the work, when, uh, when several players have autonomy in the work, um, the work benefits. So I, it's similar to how I have always approached um, the possibilities of drawing. Okay, so back to lore. It was amazing to be invited um, to have the opportunity to show the work in Lahore. And I think one of the reasons where I've not had shown in Lahore is because I've really barely done a handful of commercial shows. So, you know, here this, um, the platform of the Lahore Biennial was um, fantastic. It was allowing um, all different languages to, to come and um, engage and be visible. And there was a great um, reception in general uh, towards the entire exhibit. And I, I, I definitely um, found that incredibly generative for myself. So I was born, I grew up in Lahore in a multi-generational family. And in my, um, so, so I found these um, early drawings, self-portrait, portrait of my father. I, um, you know, so if I was remembering um, kind of the interest in the colonial history, so of course, the experience of high school at the convent of Jesus and Mary, the one thing that I recall is switching back and forth from English to Urdu medium instruction, at, you know, especially in high school, when there was a period under Zia's period where the whim of the government, you know, and that to me was such a failed cultural reform experiment. Although sort of an education in an English medium Catholic school was seen advantageous, um, it's predominantly English curriculum and rote learning I had to consciously dismantle later as an artist. Textbooks did not reflect our realities. 1980s in Lahore was definitely a very confusing time for me. So that, you know, that type of British schooling or the residue, re residual of that, National College of Arts also had that uh, residue of colonial history. Not only was the first principal a British colonial officer, John Lockwood Kipling, but also the methodologies of making art were deeply entrenched in the Eurocentric aspirations. Miniature painting in 1986, when I started, was not popular. I, um, and you know, I, I arrived at NCA in search of a creative environment to reflect upon the mechanisms of power and the potential for individual freedom. This was an instinctive decision to leave the Canaid College for Women where I felt out of sync with the overbearing waiting for marriage culture. Ziaul Haq's military dictatorship was robbing the youth of its innate need to express. So I felt increasingly stifled and finding one's calling definitely was urgent. So in that, that is essential in understanding, you know, how perhaps I went from a career in mathematics to art. I was studying advanced math at um, Canade, 
and I went into NCA out of curiosity. I wanted to go there. It had a reputation for um, being progressive and being able to allow uh, students to think and um, across sort of, um, and people that were coming, students were coming from different parts of the country. And it was at that time was not that simple to um, get permission. It seems so strange now, <laughs> but it's true. And um, um, before I joined NCA, I was working with the Orat Foundation. That was my first job, was with uh, the late Lala Roh, and I worked, uh, I designed the um, page and, and, and a book I worked on with her and Seymour Foundation on rape. And these, I think that too is very interesting when I think that um, that my interest in miniature painting was sparked by my own lack of knowledge about the miniature painting tradition. So when I came there, it was clear to me that the tradition was truncated at, at best, and its custodian, Bashir Ahmed, was struggling to find A-plus students to work with. Miniature painting at NCA was a colonial project linked to the English provenance of reviving the Indian crafts. There was definitely no discussion around the intelligence within the genre of miniatures or the merit of pursuing such a tired craft. What I also encountered at NCA was a spirit regarding who and what could be the modern miniaturist, restricted to mostly copying the historical miniature paintings with some changes was Bashir Ahmed's work, and on the other side, the conceptual work of Zuhur al who was engaging the language of historical miniatures through the canon of Western painting. So my interest was to really um, learn the, the actual craft, to, to paint on the small paper, the burnish the paper, go ahead and learn all of that because that was, there was no other um, shortcut. That the, way, the way it was set up was that Bashir was going to teach you what he wanted to teach you. And, there, and as a young artist, I remember the frustration in uh, the immense amount of labor that uh, was required in creating and crafting um, each artwork, each painting. And, um, but at the same time, I think, um, you know, one's youthful energy, 18 hours a day probably uh, was, I, I had the patience to do that, but at the expense of not making friends because I was always working. So, um, you know, I would advise my students differently. Um, so I, um, oh, so, um, you know, the significance of local artists was overshadowed by the art history curriculum itself too. I often wondered the logic of reading art through the ages that did not include South Asian artists there were no special courses at that time to discuss the history of Pakistani art either. And in terms of miniature painting, its pre-colonial history was written mostly by the West from the perspective of Eurocentric 19th century scholarship. So without deep critical conversations about English conquest, dispersion, revival of the arts within the academic institution itself, the identity of a Pakistani art was in flux. Such missing gaps before the internet were huge lacunas in my early development. The colonial residue, the military cult military's culture of uncertainty, dictatorship's moral ambiguity, along with the feudal hierarchies in Pakistan, felt like a stalemate in those early years. So uh, my thesis was the scroll, and it's a personal exploration of identity within a focal social cultural space. I was inspired to reflect on the internalizing process of labor as a means of creative intimacy unleashed by miniature painting's intense craft. 
the extensive labor required to paint the micro details in the work with thin hairbrushes was both a deeply conflicting and equally meditative experience. The tedious weight of the labor and the prescribed tradition alongside the innate desire to create unencumbered art was often hard to manage at a young age. So there is a critique of another kind of labor in the scroll. The scroll, class and gender based household labor and menial domestic tasks. The conditions of the specific location are not that important in this work. The house could be countless upper middle class houses in Lahore. There is the literal space and that becomes the site of the work as well as the critique of the work. For me, the scroll was not only an act of reclamation as in taking ownership from its colonial representation, I was seeking to link miniature painting to a pictorial tradition earlier than the colonial history, connecting it to the Safavid tradition in an attempt to step outside of the colonizer and the colonized paradigm. Imagining Safavid painter Bahzad's tightly compressed, perfectly balanced language with its various Sufi metaphors within the local vernacular of eminent Nayyar Ali Dada's architecture allowed me to explore my interest in architecture and geometry. And, um, you know, I, um, the protagonist. So I did large scale drawings also to flush out the idea. So it's not just I'm making miniatures, I was already making um, large scale collages and paintings, etc. So the protagonist, a self portrait depicted in opaque and diaphanous white, traverses from the start to the end of the horizontal plane, aware of its own limited time and space. Choosing to use the interiority of a house as a place of imagination was also a moment on the present cultural. Um, kind of moment under Zia's time that restricted physical movement, especially for women in public spaces. So this journey to explore the personal had already started in Pakistan in my work. With the distance from home, the process of self-actualization came into focus. The new work started to resist the straight jacketing that I encountered in terms of one's biography who I was and what I, um, who I was and what I represented became limiting constructs as the burden projected onto me to represent a culture felt not just unfair, but alien. Becoming the other, the outsider, through the polarizing paradigm of East-West led to an outburst of iconography of fragmented and severed bodies androgynous forms, armless, headless torsos, self-rooted, floating half-human figures reminiscent of female and children's bodies. Explicit, dislocated, buoyant, experimental in scale and ephemeral in nature, the work started to expand in format and medium as I started um, to paint on floors and walls and developed performance as a means to collaborate with others. Learning how to drop fear and embrace vulnerability to live the true potential of the mind with burning questions was exhilarating and painful. The search to create work which demanded internalizing also meant dealing with the frustration to unlearn. It was never as simple as creating new narratives in the miniature style. The Euro-American canon dominated the field of painting, and art history was still very much Eurocentric in the early 90s. Even though the big theme emerging after the fall of the Berlin Wall and economic transforma transformations was globalization in the art world, contemporary art from South Asia was still not visible in exhibitions or in gallery representations. Reading art journals and art history books that did not relate or represent one's experiences, one had to use imagination a lot. 
my work started to breach national boundaries to dismantle control over women's bodies in visual and national representations. Ismat Chuktai, Kishwar Nahid started conversing with Fatima Mernisi, Bell Hooks, Helen Susu, as I started to manipulate the established forms and pictorial conventions of miniature paintings further. Decolonizing also meant to locate context and intimacy across race and sexuality. By dislocating traditional framing devices of center and margin within miniature painting, I could open up the narratives of gender and sexuality. I started layering it further with iconographies of gender to punctuate the androgynous within the eroticized space. Okay, I might be running late on time. Five minutes left. So um, obviously uh, more than half is of my uh, conversation is still left. Uh, perhaps I will share some images and um, I could also show a clip of uh, Parallax. Parallax, perhaps, though people would have seen it here. It was um, exhibited in 213. But, um, okay. I'm <laughs> 
الشوق يغزو مضجعي قد تعثرت بحظي فالتوى كاحل الحظ غدا لم يرجعي ويح شعري ويح شعري لا حموتي يا وقتوى وفد قلبي والهوى لم يرزعي ذاك نبض الطهر ذاك نبض الطهر يسري وشموخي لم يهن لم يضرعي يا شهي البوح يا شهي البوح جرحي من طوى في عيوني قد تبدى مطمعي فسك بالأحلام فسك بالأحلام هيا والدوى لا تبالي بالشقاء الصبر ضلت مسمعي يا جبين 